In this video, we look at the process to develop a demonstration for the Spectra Element Library in that is used to showcase barotropic Kelvin waves. First, I absolutely hate when I watch videos and they immediately start with domain-specific jargon. Now, I have to assume some core knowledge, otherwise this video would be an undergraduate degree in mathematics long. So, what the hell is a barotropic Kelvin wave? Assume that you live on the planet Earth. Despite what you may think, the Earth is round-ish, and it rotates. When we apply f equals ma on a rotating sphere for a fluid traveling at low Mach numbers, we reasonably arrive at the incompressible Navier-Stokes and spherical coordinates under rotation. For a planet like Earth, gravity is directed mostly along radial lines. The distance fluid parcels in the ocean travel along radial lines is at best order one kilometer. Laterally, parcels travel about order a thousand kilometers, giving an aspect ratio of d over l which is about 10 to the minus 3. Using a series expansion about d over l, the leading order balance gives us what's called the hydrostatic primitive equations. Look, spherical coordinates are hard, so we simplify the equations further by considering only a Cartesian box that is tangent to the planet Earth at some central latitude. The Coriolis force that matters is the component that is in the tangent plane. The projection of the Earth's rotation onto the tangent plane normal vector is what we call f, the Coriolis parameter. Now I promise you, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. Now, to really make the problem simpler, we consider flows that have lateral velocity components that are uniform top to bottom. Now, if we integrate the f-plane hydrostatic primitive equations over the depth and apply no normal flow boundary conditions at the fluid-free surface and at the seafloor, we arrive at the nonlinear shallow water equations. Last, for slow enough flows, we can linearize about a motionless state to get what's called the linear shallow water equations. Look, you may hate this derivation or say it's too fast, too sloppy, or just plain wrong. I'll tell you what, if I get 2,000 subscribers, I will do a complete derivation from the spherical incompressible Navier-Stokes equation all the way down to the linear shallow water equations on an F-plane. Now, on to Kelvin waves. In short, Kelvin waves are coastally trapped inertia gravity waves that have a preferred direction of propagation. To illustrate this, we look at plane wave solutions for the linear shallow water equations in the vicinity of a straight wall boundary where the no normal flow boundary conditions must be satisfied. So, we start with the domain with a no normal flow wall at x equals zero. In the interior of the flow, we assume that the depth is constant, and at x equals zero, we say that u equals zero so that we satisfy the no normal flow condition. What we want to do is find wave solutions for the free surface height, which means we need a single equation for eta. So we start by taking time derivatives of the momentum equations and combining terms so that we can decouple u and v from each other. This leads to an operator out in front of u and v, which is the second derivative of time plus the Coriolis frequency squared. We can then apply this operator to the free surface height equation to develop a single equation just for the free surface height. Substituting in the right hand side of our decoupled equations for u and v gives us a single equation only in terms of eta. This equation is called the field equation for the free surface height. Now we can plug in plane wave solutions for eta and derive what is called the dispersion relation. Plane wave solutions are complex exponentials, which allows us to turn differential operators into algebraic ones, which is quite convenient. Taking the second derivative of the free surface height with time just gives us minus sigma squared eta, where sigma is the wave frequency. Similarly, del squared eta just gives us negative of k squared plus l squared, where k and l are wave numbers in the x and y directions respectively. Substituting these into the field equation for the free surface height gives us the dispersion relation for inertia gravity waves. Now we want to impose a no-normal flow boundary condition. The no-normal flow condition will modify the dispersion relation for the inertia gravity waves and result in the dispersion relation for Kelvin waves. First, we say that u is equal to zero, and using the equation for u that we found previously when we decoupled the momentum equations, we have eta xt plus f eta y, which we then substitute in for eta, the plane wave solution. Combining these into the no-normal flow condition gives us k equals minus i f l on sigma. We can substitute this back into the dispersion relation for the inertia gravity waves and work out the dispersion relation that's left over. Upon simplification, we find that L is equal to plus or minus sigma on C. K is equal to minus or plus IF on C. If we substitute this back into the dispersion relation, we find that we have traveling waves in the Y direction and we have exponential decay in the X direction. Now, in order to have a solution that is bounded, we have to choose the mode that corresponds to the, the exponential decay mode actually being decaying. So we have to choose the mode that corresponds to the plus if on c value for k. I promise you, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So let's recap. We have our plane wave solution for eta, 
Now it just so happens when you work all this out that you have a preferred direction for the wave propagation. Particularly when f is greater than zero, waves are going to travel to the south. In other words, the coast is going to be on the right. Now if we think about the force balance that's actually going on here to explain why this is the correct solution, let's look at a vertical cross section in the xz plane. Here we have a peak in the free surface height on the coast. Underneath the peak of a Kelvin wave, the velocity is in the same direction as the propagation. So in this case, we have a pressure gradient force which is pointing in the direction offshore, and the resulting Coriolis force that's associated with that velocity field points onshore completely in balance with each other. Note that the decay scale offshore is the ratio of the gravity wave speed and the Coriolis frequency. This is called the Rosby radius of deformation. So now let's look at designing an experiment that illustrates Kelvin waves. So we're going to use a circular domain with a no normal flow boundary condition on the outside. We'll choose a positive Coriolis parameter so that Kelvin waves will propagate in a counterclockwise direction. To initialize the model, we use a Gaussian distribution in the free surface height, and we'll set them in geostrophically balanced. Now my hope is that the inexactness of the numerics here is going to kick off a radiation of gravity waves that will go in all sorts of directions, and at some point when that gravity wave hits the wall, we'll kick off a Kelvin wave that wants to travel in a counterclockwise direction. We design a main program where we set the Coriolis parameter to a value of 10, and we set the, we set the time step size so we're not violating the CFL condition associated with the gravity wave traveling through the smallest length scales of our domain. As stated, we'll set the initial condition for the free surface height using a Gaussian. We'll define our Coriolis parameter as a constant value, and then we'll use the diagnosed geostrophic velocity function to set the initial condition for the velocity fields. And nothing happens. Well, this, this is kind of an interesting surprise for me. I'm actually glad to see that the diagnosed geostrophic velocity function that we're using is actually putting in a numerically consistent version of the geostrophic fields so that we get an exact balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force. However, this doesn't actually help us illustrate what's going on with Kelvin waves. So let's inject a little bit of noise into this simulation to see if we can kick off Kelvin waves. Okay, so we have the same domain as we had before with the high pressure in the center. We're going to diagnose the geostrophic velocities and we're going to add a small amount of random noise to the solution. So we do this just by using the same thing we did before for our initial condition. Now we just use the random function in Fortran to add a little bit of noise. So let's see what happens. Oh, okay, this kind of demonstrates it. It looks kind of ugly here. You can kind of see some patterns that are traveling around the domain, but it's really not terribly clear that there's actually a wave propagating in a counterclockwise direction. I want something a little bit more clear. Okay, so we'll leave our, our noise inside of, this, inside of the simulation, but this time we're not going to set the U and V velocities initially, hopefully kick off a little bit more of a coherent signal that can travel around the domain. So, while this simulation is cool, it's not really depicting a Kelvin wave, and in fact it's something I would call colorful fluid dynamics. Okay, so this is not really doing what we, what we need, and in fact what occurs to me at this point is we actually need, need a little bit of asymmetry in the problem. We can't really trigger a release of, of noise from the center of the domain because this only gives us radial mode. So instead in this simulation what we're going to do is move that high pressure a little bit off center here, see if we can kick off a Kelvin wave. Okay, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Again, really cool, not a Kelvin wave. This time in our domain, we'll put that disturbance right up against the wall. We'll blast off a Kelvin wave. Now, from what we're seeing, we should see a gravity wave that ejects towards the interior of the domain, and hopefully this time a Kelvin wave that kicks off in a counterclockwise direction. Let's see what happens. And there we have it. We have some gravity waves that are radiating around in the interior, and we, we have a clear high pressure signal that's traveling in a counterclockwise direction. This simulation's working. Now to really clean things up, we'll add a little bit of linear drag to the solution so those initial disturbances damp themselves out over time, and we get a much clearer picture of our Kelvin wave. Okay, so now that we have a working example, let's demonstrate the preferred direction of a Kelvin wave. We'll set the Coriolis parameter to a negative value. Now in this case, the Kelvin wave should travel around the domain with the coast on its left, so it should be going in a clockwise direction. Now there's a lot more to be done here in terms of validating this model. We want to make sure the Kelvin wave is traveling at the right speed. With the drag coefficient, we're using that the uh, signals are decaying at the, right, at the right rate. All of these things we're actively working on through convergence studies, but we figured we'd share with you some of our process uh, for generating these tutorials for you.